Dr. Antonio Bianco, thank you so much. It is just an honor to have you on my podcast because actually, well, two things. Number one, I told you this off camera. I have many of your research papers saved. I have that little Mendeley thing that we can save when we're going through a, a doctoral degree, dissertation, master's degree. We get to save these really cool papers. I have so many of yours saved. And I actually recorded a podcast in October of 2020 where I referenced you. And I, I actually referred to him like, he's my favorite researcher because he broke the mold. He talks about T3. Uh, so thank you. I am honored to have you as a guest. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, Amy. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, you know, I want to dive in. I mean, you, you wrote a book. I have it right here, Rethinking Hypothyroidism. Fantastic book. I mean, you really go through... I, I do. I, I love how you wrote it for patients. So it's very understandable for patients, but I would definitely recommend that many doctors read it as well, right. because you are, you're, you're getting into the weeds of the thyroid and where treatment started and how it's evolved. So what, what made you even write this book? What, what are you seeing, I guess, in your research and in in patients that you felt like this book needs to get out there? Well, I mean, everything started about 10 years ago. Uh, and I tell that story in, in my book when I saw two patients that made me stop and think that perhaps we did not get this completely right. I mean, treatment of hypothyroidism, who, which I learned in medical school to be such a straightforward and simple thing, uh, perhaps it wasn't the, that easy and, and straightforward. And so 10 years ago, these two patients made me switch a little bit the focus of my research, which was very basic, very fundamental in the molecules that are involved in thyroid hormone action to actually address some clinical questions, uh, whether or not we're doing a good job when we treat patients that have hypothyroidism, we just leave with thyrox. So there was a lot of you know work that was done. Studies were published. That I think we we found some things. Other people around the world, other scientists, also uh, were on the same uh, page, and they were also investigating different things. So I think in the last ten years, a lot of scientific progress was made in the field of hypothyroidism. And I thought that what was missing was a connection of all of these dots that were old uh, information that was super important and available. However, because we had this idea that levothyroxine resolved everything about hypothyroidism, we sort of stopped looking at other things. So I, I like to say that uh, research in hypothyroidism was not as fast as it should have been starting around the 70s. And uh, there was a catch up during these last 10 years. And I thought writing a book would make sense because a, a lot of uh, the pieces could be connected in a story that could be uh, both uh, convincing physicians that they have to take a second look at how they treat their hypothyroid patients, and also uh, uh, ensuring patients that we are thinking about them and we are listening that perhaps their complaints are not uh, completely, can't be completely disregarded. We need to look at what they're saying and we need to try to address it from a scientific point of view. Absolutely. And do you think that I mean, you coming from conventional medicine, do you think that we can get through to conventional medicine doctors now? Because, I mean, you've talked about it. I've talked about it on here before. I mean, as you know, you learn one thing in medical school. Right. Test That's TSH, right. treat with T4, period. Right. Do you think that we can start breaking the mold of that so. and getting these docs to think outside the box. I think so, because the way we do this is with studies, is with data. We need to get data out there. And I think that as again, I mean, if you look, very uh, comprehensive studies have been published in, in hypothyroidism and treatment of hypothyroidism. And just recently we published a study showing that 
uh, the number of, if you look at the new patients that were diagnosed with hypothyroidism, how do doctors treat them? The number of doctors, uh, the number of patients that the first medicine is combination therapy has mm -hmm. doubled in the last 10 years. Okay. So that is amazing in this country to the point that we have maybe about 2 million patients with hypothyroidism today that are receiving one form or the other of combination therapy. That means includes levothyroxine and a T3. Oh, that is, that. that's absolutely, that gives hope. That yes. gives hope to many. It really does. It's a sign of change. Absolutely. It is. It's definitely a sign of change. So on the role of TSH, you talk about this a lot in your book as well. Why is it that that so many rely on just TSH alone? And, and really, how important is it in testing? Well, TSH, uh, when we talk about TSH, we need to think about two situations. First, in the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. And second, in the follow-up of patients that are being treated for hypothyroidism. And in the diagnosis of hypothyroidism, TSH has a dominant role. Uh, I know there's great contention between physicians and patients. Uh, patients feel symptoms of hypothyroidism and TSH is not going up. So you know that hypothyroid patients, TSH should be higher. So the reflex reaction said TSH doesn't work. So we believe that TSH works in most cases, in the predominant number of cases with hypothyroid. When does TSH does not work? Well, there's a condition called central hypothyroidism. There are problems in the brain and in the pituitary gland, this gland that controls the thyroid gland. And some individuals have a dysfunction in these glands, pituitary or hypothalamus, and then TSH is really not a good indicator of thyroid function. The number of individuals that have central hypothyroidism is very small. However, when you talk about 20 or 30 million patients with hypothyroidism in this country, uh, even of a small percentage, let's say we have 5% with central hypothyroidism, it becomes a huge number. So. Right. I think we, we cannot disconsider the possibility that uh, TSH, uh, that central hypothyroidism uh, exists and should be investigated. Now, having said that, there are other things that can mask the utility of TSH. For example, a reduced caloric intake. Uh, when patients eat low calories, TSH is going to be repressed, is going to be diminished mm -hmm. and that we cannot trust completely the TSH level. I mean, this is a something, an information that both doctor and patient need to factor in when looking mm -hmm. at their results. There are certain drugs, uh, for example, retinoic acid or steroids, they will also slow down secretion of TSH. So, you know, there's got to be a, a, a real thinking, real good thought about how to interpret a TSH that is not going up when the symptoms indicate that they could go up. But the vast majority, again, more than 95% of the patients, TSH is a wonderful, phenomenal tool. Uh, the problem is that when it doesn't work and you have a lot of patients that it could potentially not work, then it becomes a problem. Now, if you look at, is TSH a good marker? when we treat patients with hypothyroidism. That's something that I go uh, at, you know, at, at, and I talk about it in the book. Then I have my question. Then I, I'm not sure. Then I, I really question the utility of TSH because what happens is when you treat someone with levothyroxine, you can normalize TSH, but the T3 levels are not fully normalized. Right. And, and this is something we studied uh, in that in my lab. We came up with a mechanism for why that is. So if you're only focusing on TSH, you're forgetting about T3 that could, could be, be below the reference range or at the bottom of the reference range. So 
Having a normal TSH doesn't mean the T3 is normalized. That is the key information. And why is this so important? T3 is the active hormone. T3 is the hormone that resolves the symptoms. Yep. So if you if you can't normalize serum T3 levels, T3 in the blood, then, I mean, I think that uh, it's it becomes a problem, really. I agree. I'm always talking about the importance of T3. And right. I mean, I've been doing this for seeing patients for about 27 years now. And that is the pattern that I always see is a normal TSH, even in a functional optimal TSH, which in functional medicine, we like it below a two. So right. I'll even have patients come in with a, a one or a 0.9 TSH, but then you go to the free T3 and like you said, it might be a 2.2, .2, or it might just be right over that normal standard exactly. lab value You're in 2.3. Exactly. And they're suffering. And I'm really happy that you said that about the caloric intake, because how many patients are so frustrated and they drop their calories and they That's do right. the intermittent fasting. And then the TSA, yeah. exactly. I mean, are we, uh, I used to receive uh, several referrals from my colleagues uh, not understanding why T3 and T4 were low and TSH wasn't going up. Patients were, were on a severe caloric restriction to lose weight. And yep. that is what happens. Yep, exactly. Now in the book, you, you state that the body wants to keep T3 normal, but we don't look at it enough in conventional medicine. Can you explain that whole process of how the body really wants to normalize T3? Right, sure. So this is really amazing. So uh, as you know, most T3 is produced outside of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland produces some T3, but most of it is produced through those enzymes called diadenases, right? So that means different tissues, different organs in our body can convert T4 to T3. So, so that, you know, about 80% of all T3 in the blood comes from outside of the thyroid gland. Now, when you uh, challenge the system that regulates the thyroid gland, and we did this in our lab, uh, creating animals with different genetic mutations, we see that the, the axis, the, the, the system that controls the thyroid, the TSH and TRH, they all change. T4 levels change. However, the only thing that does not change are the T3 levels. So every time we challenge the mechanisms that regulate the thyroid gland, they bend over backwards, change, but the T3 remains stable. So even when we completely eliminate those enzymes that convert T4 to T3, we created a little mouse that lacks the deiodinases de that convert T4 to T3. You would think, wow, T3 must be very low in those mice. No, not at all. T3 is absolutely normal because the thyroid reacts and defends serum T3 levels. Now, what happens when the patient has hypothyroidism? Patient lack, lost that ability to defend serum T3 levels. Mm -hmm. And so serum T3 levels are then regulated by these different tissues in the body that contain the diagnosis. And we've always, I learned that that was not a problem because these diagnosis could adjust and compensate for what the thyroid was producing. As it turns out, they don't, okay? And that's super sad. Uh, because I have lectured, I have my old slide showing that the diagnosis could do this job. And in fact, it's just not true. We have known this since the 70s, 1970s, there are studies showing that uh, the diagnosis by themselves cannot maintain uh, T3 levels where it should be. As you mentioned, it's either at the very bottom of the normal range or below the normal range. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I, in my book, I focus on the idea that uh, when we treat patients with hypothyroidism, we forgot about T3 and we should not forget. We should bring that information back and we need to fix it. Now, where do you like to see 
free T3 or even total T3 levels in your patients? So I think that we don't have a number. What I think it's the T4 that's slightly elevated, T3 is slightly reduced. I want to bring this to the normal range again. Mm -hmm. I think that if we aim at having within the normal range, but in the middle of the normal range, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Best of all, and I see many patients doing that now, if a patient knows that that patient is going to go through thyroidectomy, so meaning surgical removal of the thyroid gland because of a thyroid nodule or something, we need to make every effort to measure serum T3 before the surgery. So right. we know where it was when the thyroid was healthy. And I think that after treatment, we should, the, the goal should be, let's bring the T3 back to where it was before the surgery. I think this is really such a simple thing, such a simple thing that it could, could avoid problems in the future. Well, I think it's absolutely ridiculous to give a thyroidectomy patient T4 only because I, I, how can you even possibly normalize them and optimize them when you just remove the thyroid gland that, like you said, it produced a little bit of T3, but it also helped to convert it. So now we're just going to give them T4. Of course, they're going to suffer. I'm sure you saw that a ton as well in your patients. Yeah. No. Yeah. So the, the problem is, I mean, a, a little bit of understanding as well. Why, why did we fall into this trap? Uh, because that strategy that fails to normalize T3, it actually works for a lot of patients. So we, most patients with hypothyroidism, you and I don't see those patients. They're being seen by primary care physicians, gynecologists, geriatrics. Right. There are millions. If all of these patients were all of a sudden come to the thyroid specialist, we would not be able to see them. So Treatment with levothyroxine only uh, works for most patients. However, it doesn't work for a minority. Those are the ones we see. However, a minority, again, of 20 million people is a huge minority. That, uh, it, it sounds minority, but we're talking about millions of people. Is lot, that? Yeah. So, and that's the problem. So for those ones, levothyroxine alone, I, I, I have my question, my doubts. I, I think... Uh, for those, we should do a better job. Now, I heard a stat from A4M, the Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, and they were stating that only 2% of the population does well on T4 monotherapy, where 98% will benefit from combination therapy. But but you say like really it's it's a small percentage, like 15 to 20% needing T3. Now, are you talking about all of hypothyroid patients. I mean, I, I really think it's very rare that I see someone doing well on T4 only. Yeah, well, no, because very they rare. Go, right. I mean, I think that that's the point. So how many patients are we talking about? Now, depends on who you ask. If you were to come to my clinic, most of my patients are patients for whom levothyroxine didn't work because yeah. I funnel, I I attract these patients because of the kind of work I do. Right. Now, if you go to an office of a primary care physician that treats a lot of other diseases, you're not going to see a lot of those patients. So the, uh, we've been talking about what is the number. In my book, I put the number at 10, between 10 and 20%. Mm -hmm. Now, many patients uh, email me and said, it 20, it's much more than 20%. <laughs> right. Many doctors email me and said it's much less than 10%. Wow. So I, I think uh, we are still, we don't know how many. And I think that that's not so important. What is important is to acknowledge that they exist because yeah. a lot of physicians do not even acknowledge that levothyroxine therapy can fail. And right. I think that is a big deal. A big deal because I would like to see more thyroid experts saying levothyroxine is phenomenal. However, for some patients, it did not, it does not fully, it's not fully effective. Right. Right. Exactly. So uh, you mentioned the 
the D1 and D2. I want to go down that rabbit hole because I have not yet talked about the deiodinase enzymes on my podcast yet. And you're right. the expert. So let's really break down. I mean, I talk a lot about reverse T3. So I want you to get into how the the D1 and D2 help with reverse T3 and D1 clearing the reverse T3. Right. So start, let's start breaking down those enzymes and their importance. Okay. There are two deiodinases that can activate thyroid hormone. That activate thyroid hormone means transform T4 to T3. There's the type one and the type two. Mm -hmm. uh, D1 was discovered uh, in the 70s. And for 10 years, everybody thought, well, this is the deiodinase. The but then uh, in the 80s, the D2 was discovered. And through studies that were done at UCLA and in other places, they discovered that D2 is the key enzyme that produces T3 for the circulation. So 80% of the T3 in the circulation in humans comes from the type 2 deiodinase. So this is a critical enzyme. D1 is not important. Yeah, D1 is important. D1 makes the other 20%. They are regulated differently. Uh, D1 is sort of a lazy enzyme when it comes to transformation of T4 to T3. Okay. D2 is the active enzyme, is the one that really does a good job. So when we think about a hypothyroid patient that is being treated with levothyroxine, we should think, yeah, D2 is converting a lot of T4 to T3, and that's where the T3 is coming from. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned reverse T3. Reverse T3 is that molecule that loses an atom of iodine in the opposite position of T3. Mm -hmm. So, and what happens is that reverse T3 is dead. It's not, doesn't do anything. Reverse T3 does not bind to the thyroid hormone receptor. It has no affinity for binding to the thyroid hormone receptor. So T4 can be converted either to T3 or to reverse T3. If it goes to T3, it's active. If it goes to reverse T3, it's inactive, it's dead. Yep. Now, many uh, doctors use levels of reverse T3 in the circulation to estimate this pa alternative pathway. Where is the T4 going? Because the thinking is, okay, we are giving levothyroxine to, I'm giving levothyroxine to my patient, but is the deiodinase converting a T4 to T3 or to reverse T3? And I think that that is the, 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 the idea that let's look at reverse T3. Now, the problem with reverse T3 is that when you measure reverse T3 in the circulation, uh, a lot of its levels have to do with the clearance of reverse T3 through D1. D1 is the enzyme that clears. Clears means removes reverse T3 from the circulation. Mm -hmm. So if you have normal T4 levels and you have a slightly elevated reverse T3 in a patient that is taking levothyroxine, most likely you have a problem with the D1 pathway. Uh, we actually identified a couple of years ago two families that had mutations in the gene that encodes the type 1 deiodinase how did we find them? Because everything was normal, but reverse T3 was higher. Yeah. So therefore, I think even though D1 contributes less for T3 production in patients with hypothyroidism, if there's an elevation in reverse T3, it could mean that reverse T3 is not being cleared from the circulation. And that would indicate that T3 production is compromised through the type 1 deiodinase pathway. So I know it's it, it's a little bit complicated. These enzymes uh, are tricky, but uh, I think we moved because in the past, you would ask an academic uh, thyroid specialist, oh, do you measure reverse T3 in the circulation of patients with hypothyroid? <laughs> Forget about it. that's useless. Right. Now, right. so, and I think that this publication that we had uh, showing that mutations in the type one gene elevates reverse T3, that shows me that that pathway of T3 production has been compromised. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And I have many patients with elevated reverse T3, especially uh-huh. if it's on Levo or high amounts. Of, I'll also see that if if a patient is on T4 monotherapy and they just keep getting their dose increase, maybe their doctor gave them a teeny tiny amount of T3 of lyothyronine, like five, 10 micrograms. But that that amount of T4 is just so overpowering, they convert it to reverse. And I'll see that elevator reverse. And that's the issue right there. And then you lower the T4 dose, increase the T3 dose, the reverse comes down, the patient feels better. Right. I mean, yeah. I think you're you're right on the spot when you say the levels of reverse T3 depend on the levels of T4. Yes, yeah. that's absolutely right. When you look at reverse T3, you always should look at the T4 because if you have a high T4, that's exactly, reverse T3 comes from T4. So if you keep building up T4, reverse T3 is going to go up as well. Yeah. So we should always look at both at the same time. And I heard you say, and I actually, again, use this as a quote in one of the the talks that I've given that endocrinologists know that if you give T4 and you keep building up that dose, it's going to drop the T3 levels. And it's it's fascinating because it's like they know it and they still do it because they don't place the importance on T3 like they should. Yeah, we have shown this very recently. I, I, I would not say that this is a, a, a widespread thing because we are still, uh, I published a couple of papers on it. Uh, I showed recently a paper in which uh, T4 can go up, up and up. T3 absolutely does not change at all. Uh, in, and there are situations that you're right. The more T4 you give, you kill the enzyme that makes T3. It's a it's a self-regulatory mechanism. And you can kill T3, which is, can you imagine? If you give a lot of T4, you can kill T3 production. We we I don't think we were prepared for that information, but in certain parts of the body, that's certainly true. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to the the D1, D2, and I'm going to throw out myself as an example so we can kind of unpack that. I've never tested my genetics to see if I have a SNP of the D1, D2, but I am T3 only. And if you give me T4 at all, you won't see my reverse climb as quickly as my symptoms do. So you could give me 25 micrograms of Levo and I will be 10 pounds heavier in a week I will be clinically depressed. I will have no motivation whatsoever. My energy will be in the, in the toilet that quickly. And I know mm-hmm. because I've experimented on myself. Mm-hmm. So how, I mean, would you say without even testing me, I probably have some kind of mutation in my, what would it be? The D2 pathway? Uh, I don't think I can, I can say that. Uh, what okay. I can tell you is this. Uh, 10 years ago, when I started looking at this carefully, uh, what, when a patient came to my office and said, I take only T3. And I think I I even talk about these patients in my book. I would just say, you're absolutely nuts. You're, you're doing something wrong. This is wrong. You need to take T4. And I would try to convince and try and the patient's the most of them were very nice and said, yeah, let's try this, try that. I never was able to do it because those patients only felt good taking T3. Now, as I progressed in this journey of understanding more about the treatment of hypothyroidism, I saw that there are many patients that only do well on T3. And I had to learn this from my patients, not from any book or any meeting, conference, nothing, because this is, uh, you know, you don't talk about that. Right. Giving only T3, you don't, you don't go to a conference and talk about that. Uh, so I learned that from my patients. Now, what I know today is what you described is absolutely right. Some patients cannot function, can, can only function well taking T3 monotherapy. Why that is, I don't know. I think that we still need to understand that. I do not believe at least the SNPs that we know are could explain this. 
Could a SNP explain this? Yeah, it could, but we don't know anyone that could. We're still trying to understand. The problem is this is such a taboo topic yeah. that uh, I I can I mean that we would need to get doctors to get a group of patients that only function on T3 blindly. We would need to do a blinded study, you know, in which the doctor doesn't know what's prescribing, the patient doesn't know what's receiving. Uh, and we would need to address that. But, you know, I don't see anyone doing that in the near future. Maybe they will, but we, I, I don't know the mechanism to explain why you feel the way you feel. Mm -hmm. And that'd be a hard sell too, because those of us who are T3 only, no way in hell are you going to give us T4 <laughs> because we know well, how we're going to feel. Well, so. <laughs> as part of the study, I mean, I, I think that you volunteer to understand this better. As right. part of the study, you have a 50-50 chance to be randomized to, to T3 only or to T4. You do. I and think I, that I would just, be, that it, would it would be, be interesting. interesting. Yeah, it would be an interesting study, I have to say, because uh, I I bet you patients will know right away once they switched. At least that was my experience with my few patients I had on T3 only. They do not tolerate levothyroxine. And it is very rare. I, I will say that. And I'll say yeah. that for the audience too. It is very rare. I mean, if, if we were talking percents, I would say maybe, you know, one out of every, maybe 200, 500 need T3 only, but, but when Absolutely. they do, they do, you know, when, when a person is truly T3 only, and maybe the reverse T3 escalates quickly, it goes up very quickly with a small amount of T4, yeah, or maybe. maybe it doesn't. Right. Maybe yeah. symptoms come on first and those become that's how it is for me. Those become so debilitating. Now, with right. T3 only or even let's even talk about when we when we do the combination therapy, I try to explain to patients, listen, your TSH is going to go down and it's probably going to become suppressed to the point where a conventional doctor will look at it and call you hyper. So what is your take on that TSH then going down once we start adding in some T3? Mm -hmm. For combination therapy. Right. So uh, you, you, you said a couple of things very important. If we want to start someone on combination therapy, at, at least that's how I do it and how uh, it's accepted by the ac professional academic societies. You, you have to remove a little bit of the dose of levothyroxine. You have to lower yeah. Lower the dose of levothyroxine so you make space so that you can start prescribing the lyothyronine, the mm -hmm. T3. So if you do that, you're not going to suppress the TSH. You have to, to really keep in mind that there are lots of uh, uh, things to juggle here. First is the patient needs to feel better. Second is you want to bring T3 and T4 levels to the normal range. Third is you want to keep the TSH at least detectable. You uh, Having a TSH suppressed is not good. How do we know that? Because there are studies. And these studies are not controverted. They are very straightforward. There are studies with lots of patients showing that if you carry a suppressed TSH for a long time, you increase your risk of atrial fibrillation and you increase your risk of bone fractures. Now, having said that, again, we are not computers, right? Because if we are, if a, if you talk to a computer, the computer, will, if you present a problem, the computer will always give you the same answer, right? There's a balance between risks and benefits. Mm -hmm. I have had patients on a wheelchair that would not come out of the wheelchair without having a suppressed TSH. Now, uh, the patient was coming from out of state just because in the area she lived, doctors will not accept suppressing a TSH. Right. The patient was, was taking antidepressive, was following up with a psychiatrist. So what do we do in this case? Do we suppress TSH? We, do we allow suppressing the TSH with a slightly elevated dose of thyroid hormone, taking a risk, an, an increased risk 
at the same time that the benefit is tremendous for that patient. Mm -hmm. So I, for me, that's why physicians and doctors need to talk about these things and say, well, this is our collective decision here. If you are willing to take this increased risk for a better quality of life, then, and also the judgment of the physicians should be playing a role as well. In the cases I had, which were a handful, I think I had no doubt that uh, having a suppressed TSH was a benefit was beneficial for those patients. It, 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 it uh, all things considered, right? Just think about it. Patients that have thyroid cancer, how are they treated? We suppress serum TSH, TSH. for yep. years, for years and years. So why we accept the increased risk? of having a suppressed TSH because the benefit is making sure we don't have a recurrence of the cancer. Right. I mean, we, we just have to uh, not emotionally, but analyze these things in a rational way. And, and it, it does make sense. Well, it comes down to that personalized medicine, right? If you look at each Absolutely. individual and, and, and let's you know, take me, for example, of course, I have a suppressed TSH because I've been T3 only for almost 20 years. So I take care of myself. I do weight bearing exercises. I take magnesium, vitamin D with K. My bones are fine. I just had a DEXA scan last April. There, everything's amazing, right? And my heart, I've had EKGs, perfect, fine. So it, it has to be each individual. Now you might take a, an out of shape, 60 year old woman who doesn't weight train and doesn't take supplements and doesn't take care of herself and eats processed foods and has a high insulin level and has all kinds of metabolic disease. Yeah. She's going to be more at risk for bone fracture. Oh, she has more body, risk you know? factors. Yeah, more risk absolutely. factors. Exactly. So, I mean, that's why the doctor exists. Yep. The problem is that I, you know, I, we, we need to look at the whole picture. Personalized mm -hmm. medicine requires time with the doctor that's it right we go see a doctor these days you take you have 20 minutes uh because the doctor already has another patient another patient another patient so it's it's the whole the whole system is not working for patients that require more time more attention more you know a, a more intense follow-up just because the physicians and i, I and i recommend uh, when patients email me and ask, first ask a doc, find a doctor that will have time to talk to you. Because if you go to a doctor that is looking on the on the watch to, for the next patient, I, that's not going to be, it's not going to be good. Right. Right. And that's really what insurance allows, right? That five to seven minute visit is all you get nowadays. So well, five and seven, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know about <laughs> 20 minutes, <laughs> five anyway. to seven. Yeah, maybe, maybe, you know. I, I jokingly say that, but maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe you'll get 10 to 20. Maybe you'll get 10 to 20. But even 20 minutes is not a lot. It's, not yeah. a lot. it's very, very little. Right. Absolutely. Now, I also, I, I appreciate the fact in your book that you, go outside of the thyroid too. And you do mention, listen, we do have to look at perimenopause, menopausal symptoms, iodine deficiency, all the other conditions that can occur, insulin resistance that can mimic right. the same symptoms that's or right. exacerbate. Exactly. Right, exactly. I think that's really important. And I have to say, when a patient comes and says, I, you know, and I make the diagnosis of residual symptoms mm -hmm. of hypothyroidism, before we make the, the diagnosis, we need to exclude other conditions because the symptoms are not typical, you know, they're not unique to hypothyroidism. What are the symptoms? Low energy. I feel tired. I'm gaining, I have difficulty managing my body weight. Mm -hmm. I feel forgetful. I'm very sleepy my hair is falling, my skin is dry. Well, these are symptoms of perimenopausal. I mean, you can't distinguish them. Therefore, the vitamin B can cause that. Anemia, iron deficiency, as you mentioned, diabetes, obesity. So before we say, oh yeah, levothyroxine didn't work, let's start with T3. We need to do a thorough investigation and say, well, first of all, 
let's look at other conditions that could cause this. And, you know, I recently published a study, and there are others as well, showing like a, a, a pathway. How, wh wh what are the steps that the physician should take before concluding that levothyroxine has failed? What are the tests that we should ask and how to interpret those tests and what to do if the test comes back normal? It is talking with my colleagues and my experience. We would, I would think that perhaps as much as half of the patients that come with residual symptoms, you end up finding something else that's not the thyroid. And you fix that and patient will feel better. Now, it is true, there will be a lot of patients that you cannot find anything. And for those, uh, it's not me that I'm saying, the American, the British, the European Thyroid Association, for those patients, you could not find anything, we should try a, a, a combination therapy. And then don't you also find too, it's almost like the reverse. So, so not only can insulin resistance be there and contributing to the weight gain and the lethargy, but also with the thyroid being off, that can start to dysregulate insulin since that's a hormone. So it's almost like a back and forth play where it, in my opinion, you, you have to do both. You have to start treatment with the thyroid and do that properly but also at the same time address the insulin resistance so they're not feeding each other. Yeah, well, what you're saying makes perfect sense. Uh, and however, we don't have a, a clinical trial. We don't have a study showing that hypothyroidism leads to the metabolic syndrome, for example. Uh, not, let me get, track, get back here. Yeah. Hypothyroidism can do that. Not the patients treated with levothyroxine are easier to develop metabolic syndrome. That we don't have that study. Uh, uh, as far as we are concerned, when you treat someone with levothyroxine, uh, we have elevated cholesterol. Uh, even though TSH is normal, cholesterol is, remains elevated. You have lower energy expenditure. Therefore, you have a tendency to gain weight, uh, but you do not have uh, increased insulin resistance. At least we haven't demonstrated. I mean, I, I wish I had the tools right now to demonstrate. In, in my in back of my mind, I think that's true, but it hasn't been done. So, and I have the, uh, uh, as, a, as a rule, I only say things that I know that was a clinical trial showing but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that there's that co correlation there. Now Correct. you mentioned, well, I mentioned iodine. I know you mentioned it earlier in our talk. How important is sufficient iodine in, in the treatment paradigm, whether you're doing T4 monotherapy or combination therapy? Well, the iodine is the, the building block of the thyroid hormone. So when the thyroid gland is working, you need iodine. If you don't have iodine, the thyroid will not be able to produce sufficient amounts of T4 and T3. How much do we need? A hundred, about 150 micrograms, micrograms of iodine per day. That's the bare minimum. We know that, uh, for example, in this country, most people are okay in, 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 in the intake of iodine. However, certain populations are at risk of having iron deficiency. Who are they? Uh, pregnancy, for example. Mm -hmm. Pregnant women have an increase in the requirement of, of iodine. So if they're eating 150 and th now they need 250 or 300, then they're gonna be uh, at risk for iron deficiency. And that's a problem, big problem for the fetus that's yeah. developing. So iodine, iodine supplementation is actually mandatory. I mean, it should have been mandatory. I don't think it's mandatory, but it should be mandatory for uh, ladies that are become uh, pregnant. Now, once the patient has hypothyroidism, the thyroid doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Then the iodine loses its role because uh, it, it doesn't. The thyroid is not making any more. Uh, thyroid, uh, thyroid hormone, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. then I would not focus so much of iodine intake for those individuals that have hypothyroidism. 
but I would focus on especially children and pregnant women. Those are very important to have a, a healthy intake of iodine. Definitely. And what about Hashimoto's? Because I know that that's, I mean, iodine in and of itself is very controversial in our world of hypothyroidism in general, but what about with Hashimoto's? I mean, I really think you can get a 50, 50 split. If you, if you pull doctors where 50% will say, Nope, it's going to send you into a thyroid storm. You're going to become hyper. And then the other 50 say, well, you know what? I mean, your thyroid gland is being destroyed slowly by your immune system, but that iodine might come in and support the immune system. It might help regulate underlying infections and viruses and just mm -hmm. help support that T4 to T3 conversion. Okay. So Hashim, what you're talking is a patient that has TPO antibodies positive, but still has a thyroid gland that's functional. So mm -hmm. we're calling that patient Hashimoto's, right. but not necessarily with the overt hypothyroidism. So I understand. So there is a risk that if you start giving iodine, depends on the amount, right? If mm -hmm. you're giving 100 micrograms per day, you, I, I doubt it that you're going to trigger thyroid toxicosis, iodine-induced thyroid toxicosis. However, if you give large amounts of iodine, you, you, there is a possibility. It's not for sure that you're going to do that, but there is a possibility if you have a uh, a silent autonomous nodule there that requires iodine to become to go crazy and if you give a lot of iodine you can have that how do we know that sometimes it happens in patients that take iodinated uh, contrast for radiographic contrast patients that take amiodarone for example can have that which is a is an antiarrhythmic that contains a lot of iodine mm -hmm. so that can happen now what I heard is that selenium has a, a role for patients that have uh, Hashimoto's uh, due to its antioxidant uh, role. I don't have any experience. This is not recommended by any professional guidelines. However, there are some publications showing that if you uh, give selenium to a patient with TPO positive antibodies, you can actually reduce the titer of the TPO antibodies. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, same with black cumin seed oil. There's been a lot of studies with, with black cumin seed and reducing TPO antibodies in place of using something like low-dose naltrexone. So what, right. what, since we're talking about it, what's your, what is your opinion on using LDN? Do you ever use that with your patients? No. Not really? No, I don't. Yeah. Uh, what I have seen is which again is not recommended by any guidelines but i have received patients that were trying to become pregnant uh sometimes they were doing ivf and uh, the doctor that was uh, taking care of that patient was concerned about positive tpo antibodies so they would be treated with steroids and in the beginning, when I first saw a patient, I said, well, this is crazy. I never heard about this because, again, it's not in the clinical guidelines. It's not in any books. This is, But you, you learn about it because the patients tell you. Right. And then uh, I, I saw many patients in which this happened. I asked my colleagues who specialized on reproduction and hypothyroidism, and they said, well, I've seen as well. Uh, the reality is the utilization of steroids in those situations reduce the titer at, of the the title of the TPO antibodies dramatically. It, so it works. Now, if that helps with the pregnancy, I don't know. I mean, I believe the doctors believe that it helps. So, yeah. but I have not seen a publication yet that maybe someone is working on this right now. Right. Right. That's interesting. I haven't heard of that either. So th that'll be interesting to see if, if anyone yeah. comes out with that. Yeah. I, I had patients, a few patients with, with that story. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Just something else to, to start looking into to yes. help patients. I'm going to throw something out at you that I totally didn't prepare you for. So it's okay if you haven't gone down this rabbit hole, but I'm going to ask you anyways, I've been looking into and have been studying this for about 15 years the role of T2 in the body. So 3,5-diodoelthyronine and how, I mean, we know it's present in 
NDT medication, natural desiccated thyroid medication, because it's present in our thyroid. But have you explored that at all? Have you gone down that rabbit hole as a potential metabolic enhancer? It increases basal metabolic rate, increases ATP production. Have you looked into that at all? Well, I looked because there are a lot of papers published about mm -hmm. that. And uh, not clinically, I, I never prescribed to anyone. I I don't have sufficient information to recommend or don't recommend. I just, for me, it, it's sort of, a, I don't know enough from a, from a clinical point of view. Now, from a scientific point of view, 3,5-T2 actually does have the effects that you are uh, mentioning, increases energy expenditure. However, uh, you need a lot to do that. It's We're not talking about small amounts of T2. You do require a substantial amount of T2. And just recently, I heard in the conference that the amount of T2 that's required to accelerate energy expenditure and activate the mitochondria and all that stuff mm -hmm. suppresses TSH. So in other words, what you're doing is you're making somebody thyrotoxic because you're giving a lot. So I don't think T2, 3,5 T2 has a physiological role. And I, I might be going out on a limb here because uh, the levels that you find in the plasma and the blood are very, very, very low. Mm -hmm. uh, we know it comes from the thyroid. Uh, it's not a product of the diagnosis because we don't have a diagnosis that can do that. Right. Remove the outer ring iodine from T3, but uh, it comes from the thyroid, but the amounts are really small. Even if you look at desiccated thyroid extract, the amount of T2 is not that large. Tiny. Yeah, it's not sufficient to achieve the effects that people have published just because they used much more. So I, I think it's 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 good to know uh, uh, that this thing exists. But again, if someone is going to take T two, uh, because I know this can be bought over the counter, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that so I would keep an eye on the TSH. Because you might as well just take T3 if that's the, then it's not going to have any different effect as far as I, I know. But right. I'm not an expert on this and I'm not recommending this at all. I just wanted to pick your brain on it since, sure, I, had absolutely. You. I, just, since no, I had you here. No, I mean, I, I think that this is, uh, this is interesting. Definitely. No, it, it is interesting when you start going down that rabbit hole. But I agree with you. The studies are showing like 150 to 300 micrograms. And in an NDT, like a 30 milligram NDT, I mean, you're might, you might be getting five to eight micrograms of T2. So you would have to take this large amount of NDT, but everything that I saw on 3,5 T2 is that it does not have a thyromimetic effects, but I guess if you take it enough and long enough, it could start pushing on TSH. It's the same way as low calorie dieting, the same way as- yeah. Intermittent fasting. And actually, that's my next question for you. I want you to touch on before you go, the intermittent fasting thing. I heard you mention that that's not always good and that that can actually push down our, our T3 levels. And so many people are doing it. So I try to tell these ladies, ladies especially, because that's who gets hit the hardest with thyroid issues. Please do not intermittent fast trying to lose weight because you could actually be making your situation worse. Do you agree? Yeah. I, I don't have information about intermittent fasting. What I have is uh, reduced caloric intake. Okay, fasting, so, fasting, like right. true, it, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be fast. If you stop eating in 24 hours, your T3 is going to be lower. That's for sure. But people that are in, taking up about 800 calories per day, 750 calories per day, that's very low amount of calories. Some people take less than that. Those individuals will have a tendency to 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 drop T3 in the circulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, probably not a good idea if you're trying to lose, to accelerate your metabolism. You see what I mean? Right. So 
I, I this is a, a a protection mechanism that the body has. If you're not eating, you, you slow down your energy expenditure because there's got to be something wrong. Maybe you're from a, a evolutionary point of view, you want to preserve food in your body. If you're not eating, you, you stop. You reduce the speed at which you're losing calories. So, uh, you know, does it happen when you do intermittent fasting? Maybe we have to have a study. Uh, we would need to do a study to find out. I don't know. Well, wouldn't that also push up reverse T3? Because since reverse goes up in any kind of trauma type of situation, if the body perceives that it's in a starvation mode, wouldn't that increase the reverse T3 as well? Reverse T3 will be up. Yeah. But, but because of what you said, but most importantly, because, you know, the enzyme that's very sensitive to fasting is D1. Mm -hmm. And D1 clears reverse T3, as we right. discussed. Mm -hmm. So when you do it uh, fasting, the first enzyme that's going to go down is D1. And that's when the reverse T3 goes up. So uh, it's it's really an, it's an automatic thing. And you can uh, monitor reverse T3 uh, because that was, that's going to show up. Well, now this is interesting because I'm going to start looking at this a little bit differently when I'm looking at patients' labs. Oftentimes, you know, we talk about the optimal value for reverse T3 in function. Of, in, in my world, it's less than a 12. I'll accept less than 15 if they're asymptomatic and the free T3 looks good and they're feeling good and all that. Then we just leave it alone. But I think too many in, in talking about the functional labs Many people, my listeners alike, will get locked in on what that number has to be. And they don't realize that maybe that number is elevated because you decided to do a three day water fast or you decided to do 18 to 20 hours of fasting every single day and eat one meal a day. So it has nothing to do with your thyroid medication and everything to do with what you're choosing to do to your body. I, I, I would agree with you. The thyroid is incredibly sensitive to caloric intake to caloric manipulation and uh, uh, the thyroid goes to sleep when you don't eat a lot of calories and then it wakes up and starts to function uh, the more calories you eat the more the thyroid will work out mm -hmm. but then when you stop eating and you reverse it's going to go back so uh, i think the situations you described could very well be affecting uh, the thyroid function and which is, uh, not ideal, I guess. Right. Right. That's the, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you said that too, because again, we, we have to look at the whole picture. We have to look at what we're doing as thyroid patients to our own bodies in trying to reduce symptoms. And sometimes those aren't the best choices. And they're choices that could actually make the situation worse. So I'm really happy yeah. that you said that. We need more studies. I think that yeah. this is all fascinating. We need more studies on this. We do. We absolutely do. Well, Dr. Bianco, thank you. I mean, just having you on has been just such a pleasure, such an honor. You've delivered so much great info for my audience. I know they're going to eat this up. So if you wanted to, do you want to leave anyone with any message or just simply Get the book and read it. That's what I'm going to say, because we're going to put this in the show notes too with a link to how to get it. Well, first of all, read the book. Yeah, <laughs> read the book. But That's second, fine. I think we're going through a very exciting time, uh, a time in which we woke up from that idea that hypothyroidism was a resolved situation, a very simple disease. I learned that in my first year of medical school, this is the easiest disease to treat. And so we spent decades thinking like that. And I believe in the last 10 years, we changed gears, we changed lanes, and we're trying to catch up. So there's a lot of hope and excitement. And I think the patients should be uh, hopeful and should uh, also look for doctors that have a little bit more of an open mind. I think that uh, we all practice different types of medicine. Uh, if a doctor uh, says, I'm going to give you levothyroxine and that's it. Okay. I mean, it, it's, you just, instead of budging heads, uh, butting heads, you just go find another doctor because right. 
the number of doctors that are more accepting uh, of this uh, idea that we still learn need to learn more about hypothyroidism has increased a lot. And you are helping to change their minds. So I, I thank so. you for that. I thank you for that. So All thank right. you once again for your time. I greatly appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely.